Um, my name is Deirdre Mendez. I am the director of the Center for Global Business. So delighted that all of you are here with us this evening for what I think is going to be a fantastic presentation. Um, uh, our two uh, guest speakers, Gretel um, Pereira and Ana Villegas, are two of my favorite people. I think of them as the dynamic duo. They're both members of the uh, board of directors of the Center for Global Business, and they are um, doing such wonderful things for us. And they had so many really exciting and cutting edge things to say about this topic. So I'm going to go ahead and let them uh, introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll get to our um, uh, questions about what is changing in the dynamic world of marketing and public relations. So Anna, would you like to uh, introduce yourself very briefly? And Anna has just taken a new, a new job, which is giving her um, new perspectives on, uh, on her field and uh, on the fast pace of change. Happy to, hi everyone. Very excited to be here with you today. I am in Chicago right now. I just arrived today because I'm attending my first legal conference. That's part of my new role. So I'm excited of learning about a completely different market. Um, I am the chief marketing officer for Affinipay. It's a fintech and SaaS company, and we provide all the backend services for lawyers and accountants and our practices. And before that, I was at NI National Instruments also as a chief marketing officer, and I have 16 years um, of experience previously uh, at Dell and before that Latin America. Thank you, so Anna. And to Gretel, Gretel um, is joining us from Expedia. Gretel, you are muted, so I'm just going to remind, there you go. Okay, I'll go next. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here and to join the virtual stage. Um, with Anna and Deidre. Um, honored to be with you all. I'm a Longhorn. Yay. Welcome, Horn. So I am a UT Longhorn graduate. I'm originally from Venezuela. And I'll introduce myself in two ways. One is like my full-time job, and my, then my full-time passion. So my job right now, I work at Expedia Group, and I am responsible for all the PR, um, for consumer PR across our three brands, which we have three main travel brands, which are Expedia, Hotels.com, and Verbo. Um, and I lead the PR across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Um, and so we'll dive into a little bit what that means later. Um, I've been working in tech PR for almost 20 years, always a PR person. I graduated uh, with journalism degree from College of Communications um, before it was moody even, so I'm aging myself. But um, I've, I've graduated with a journal, uh, journalism degree, and I've always stayed in the, the field of public relations. Um, so I'm excited to share more about my journey with you all. But then the second part of it is my full-time passion is I am also very active in the community and supporting Latina women. And I've had, that's how I, Anna and I became even close and got to know her and because I admired her and I've always admired her, but I'm also the co-founder of an organization called Latinas in Tech that empowers um, and connects Latina women in tech. Um, and also uh, right now really focused on leadership um, across for women and getting more Lan Anas in the C-suite, right? We need to get more women of color and Latinas, especially in the C-suite and in more leadership roles. So we have a really powerful group of women uh, working on that. So I'm just a huge advocate for that. And Austin Woman Magazine, hopefully some of you know it. I'm one of the proud co-owners. So lots of stuff in the community and so proud to be on the board uh, the Center for Global Business because it's near and dear to my heart. Everything we do around um, global business and my career has always been in global. So looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you so much. And uh, our two speakers are uh, too modest to mention it, but both of them have recently won all kinds of accolades. I'll let you look at that. Maybe uh, Jordana can post their LinkedIn uh, profiles in the chat in case you didn't have a chance to look at those um, in the uh, invitation that you received. So uh, without further ado, let's get for moving forward on our topic because it's, an, it's one that's so fascinating and, and relevant and um, these two speakers are at the, at the cutting edge, um, at the forefront of these changes that are going on. Probably um, some of what they'll say is obsolete since this morning. Actually, I'm just joking, but 
one of the things that they really emphasized to me is how rapidly things are changing. So we'll, we're going to start with that question. Um, what has happened to the pace and what are some of the reasons why um, the pace of, um, um, of these two related fields is changing uh, so quickly? So Anna, do you want to start? You had some really fascinating things to say when we talked earlier. I, I will be happy to start. I feel like um, you know, marketing has always been a function that have been at the forefront and driving change. But since 2020, with you know COVID, and everybody had to start and accelerate the digital transformation, and then having to go through a crisis, a recession, and a lot of uncertainty in the world, and also it's it's like people woke up of of a long, you know, sleep, and now they're finally realizing what what companies do. It's and what they what's the what they care about. It's important, right? What they stand for is important. I'm going to invest in this brand because I believe in this brand. So for marketing, all of this change in how people are engaging because now they uh, they need more digital. The fact that consumers are more aware of the relevance of and the purpose of a brand and the fact that going through a crisis is making also you know uh, investors and and um, private equity and all these firms start to ask more questions around return and being very specific of how you spend your money I think those three pillars are really accelerating how we do things in marketing and we had to pivot very quickly to be able to make sure we have the right brand we have the right message we're investing in the right places so we can justify the investments um we're putting our people first and we're also adapting to all the technology that is quickly and very fast changing you know, you can wake up one day and, you know, maybe LinkedIn gets bought by, by somebody else and LinkedIn is out of the picture or not. So there's so many things that are happening so fast that I feel like as marketers, we need to be at the forefront of that change and driving that change. Now, so th I think that's a really a fascinating point. Um, both these fields have really got to be kind of out in front of change certainly can't, you can't afford to be in response mode. And Gretel, I know that's the case for you as well. Um, what are some of the forces that you're seeing? Are they the same as for Anna? And, um, and, and what does that look like for you? Yeah, I think definitely everything Anna mentioned resonates and absolutely is relevant. We both work in the tech space, right? And tech moves fast, fast, so fast. If you fall asleep, like you will get bought out, the competitor will go faster. So you have to be fast. You have to be agile. You have to be flexible. You have to read. You have to see the news. You have to react fast. Like there's a lot. So definitely the pace is fast. I was just going to share kind of two different perspectives of at least the last couple of years, because I agree with Anna, like a lot changed. The pandemic changed a lot for us. So from a travel perspective, um, you can imagine travel stopped, right? Stopped. Like a company like Expedia stopped. Can you imagine how, what that was two years ago? I was not with the company, so I can't share too much beyond that. But I, it was a pivotal moment, right? Where as company leaders and you have to reprioritize, you have to really focus, you have to completely change the strategy to survive, right? When your whole industry stops, that is unprecedented, right? That has never happened. So that with that comes so much change. But I think the biggest change was focus, prioritizing, doing things um, with less things, but with greater impact, working smarter, not harder, right? So that is across the board. And then the flip side of that, uh, I'll share before I joined um, Expedia, I joined about a year ago, I was at Roku, which hopefully some of you will know Roku, it's a streaming player, one of the leading streaming players. That was the opposite. We were booming during the pandemic because what were we all doing? We we're all at home streaming and binge watching, right? So that for me, one, it was just an incredible experience to be part of because from a marketing PR perspective, we had to switch everything. Yes. Any physical in-person events completely canceled, right? So we had to switch like, okay, how can we connect with our consumers still that and share everything that is that you can stream and work with our partners like Netflix, HBO Max, Apple Plus to share all the content that is available while you're at home. Um, 
So it was became a very digital first, right? Which Anna mentioned that, right? It became very digital. It became um, social media was our strongest channel, influencers, everything became digital. Um, so I think that shift um, in, in the work that we do is really important because of these important moments that happen that are macro level, that are things that happen in the world that we have no control and you have to adapt to. But then there's a fast paced industry, I think also from a competitive perspective, if you look at competitors, right? And I think, Anna, you had some really good insights from your field, right? Um, for us, it's macro, right? We're the leader, a global monster in travel, right? But there's other monsters out there, right? And they move fast and they're aggressive and they have aggressive marketing campaigns. So you have to be at the forefront of that. And so we're going to dive into that a little bit of how you can be more competitive, um, on the macro level, but also literally take it to country level. Each country is different um, and the different forces in that country. And some brands are stronger in certain markets than in others. So you have to adapt your marketing strategy for those markets. So it's a lot of lot of things. So that's a little bit of that. I don't know if Anna, you wanted to talk about the competitive thing. I know you had some thoughts there from the pace in your market. Yeah, I now I'm in the fintech and SaaS, you know, industry and it's all software and um, solutions for financials. And it's a market that, you know, 40% of our audience was doing the transactions by check. If you think about lawyers, 40% of law firms are doing transactions by check. So when all of this hit them and digital, you know, and, the, and COVID came, they, they couldn't do that anymore. And I think a lot of companies start seeing the opportunity. So right now, almost every other week, there is a new pl player in my industry. I mean, I just went to walk the floor. Tomorrow the conference opens. There is so many different small, medium firms that are trying to fight the same market and they keep appearing. It's like, oh my God, what's happening here? It's, it's, it's really... Com a completely different game. So for me, I'm I'm rethinking the way we have planned, the way we go to market, the way we add agility, because it's not a, a market where you just can do something and say, okay, this is going to get us to the next level. It's a market that is constantly changing and you just have to be changing and adapting as you see all of these players coming into a market and what is going to differentiate and how you protect your uh, customers, right, from from them, stealing them from from your from your account. So I think it is again. I in my plus twenty five years career, I've never seen this, um, you know, model. I think it for me it's super exciting because it challenged you as a marketer even more. But it is a different game, the game we're playing now. So one of the things that you said, Anna, that when we talked before that I thought was so fascinating, you said, if you're in a more mature space with larger players, the players are now really super aggressive and everybody's looking for the next thing that they can leverage. So uh, that's kind of the direction they're going in. If you're a small player or you're in a startup industry um, or one that's not very well defined, you're going to have new competitors every day. So different problems but uh, also everybody's looking for some kind of edge. And so you've got to be uh, constantly on your game. You've got to be looking at the landscape either for new tools or new competitive strategies or uh, for new competitors, which may, means that it's, this is a tough environment, right? To operate in. So Greta, what are you seeing there? Yeah, I think um, everything Anna said, I think just to delve into it, like um, at least again in the travel world, you think of the obvious ones that are your competitors, but then there, there's the non-obvious ones. So it's the big, you've got the kind of the other big travel platforms as well that, that, that are competitors, but it's the other ones that are like, for example, our industry, hotels are sometimes our same competitors, smaller boutique uh, firms that do travel, travel agencies. So what we do is we help power them. Um, so it's that's how it gets complex, right? When you think of the competitive market, to Anna's point, there, there are some big ones, there are some small ones, they're appearing every day, some disappear. So how do you stay relevant? Um, I think for us, um, it's a little bit of what I was discussing earlier. It's a little bit of the, it's the focus. 
Um, and that's really where we are right now. And it's your brand marketing really stands out. And that's where at least Expedia as a company right now is really focused on that brand market and the messaging that we deliver to consumers and making sure it's a 360 message that connects with consumers. And by 360, we mean touching all points, right? It's making sure that all the teams and all the communications channels and marketing channels are aligned to the same message. We all have the same look and feel. All of that is really important to have really cohesive campaign launches and moments. So for example, we have, um, you know, different, we're organized across the different brands, but we have representation across like social media, influencer, marketing, CRM, media buying, creative. We all are, have a representative in these different meetings so that we are all aware of what everybody's doing and can, you know, go, we're all here for the same thing in terms of our objectives. So it's important to be really aligned um, with our efforts and make sure that our messaging is consistent. I think that's that's one of the biggest ones from, from our perspective. Um, I don't know, Anna, if you'd like to elaborate on that. Well, I, I, I agree. I think that it is all about putting the customer first and saying what is the best way that we need to engage with a customer holistically. And it's also the time where you have to really pick your battles. So what are the areas, the campaigns, the focus that are going to give you the more out of your resources, out of your budget, out of the time that you spend in these things? You cannot do it all. And because to, you know, being able to look at the market, adjust, adapt, do this 360 takes more time. You you cannot do that 25 different projects that, you know, we used to have back on the days where we're trying to do a little bit of everything. And regardless of where you sit in the organization, as a marketer, I do challenge my team to always come back and say, and this doesn't make sense, right? We, we shouldn't be doing this campaign because this is only driving 0.001 of the of the revenue uh, or this this campaign it's really important and we should be focusing more here because i the the challenge is as a leader as an executive i am not in the day to day so i really rely on everybody in my organization to take that ownership and come with you know ideas a has looking what the competitors are doing what do we do different because the time to to speak and to say these are the opportunities it's it's now it's no more let's just stick to the plan it's more let's challenge the plan and uh, let let's figure out how we can do the pieces that are more strategic and impactful for our businesses and our customers So one of the things that I'm hearing is that it's more that it's important to focus. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think there there was a time when there were uh, three important market segments that we have to address. Uh, and we'll address them in various ways. Is that the case now? It seems like um, increased segmentation um, is possible through because of the analysis and the tools and also the channels that people are, are using to, uh, to get information about products and services that they want. Gretel, what are you seeing there? Yeah, I'll speak very, very much in my world. I think Anna can give more of the macro view since she touches all the channels, but I'll go very narrow, which is my world, which is public relations. And what that encompasses for us is working with the press, so journalists, um, social media and influencers is really what falls under our world. Um, and that's evolved so much over the last few years, right? If just what used to be when I was at UT studying, it was about the traditional media relations and telling your story through a press release and getting in the print newspaper. That obviously is all different. We talked about it already, the power of digital. It's, it's huge, right? So we've had to adapt everything. Um, and that 360 really is, is very important across specifically those three channels, right? To make sure that when you're expressing something to the press, it's also going live on your social media channels. And then it also like you have, we work a lot with influencers and people that talk about our products through their channels as another way. So all of those have to work together. But I think also the flip side of that is interesting, Deidre, we were talking about how sometimes social media is really powerful tool for you to communicate um, to your customers, but it's also can be 
um, a very, it's a challenging tool, right? The power of social media, you cannot deny it now. I think you are all probably active users of social media and active on TikTok and the power that that has is incredible. And unfortunately for brands that, you know, you have to move super quickly, right? Because uh, of things that happen. I can share a, a recent example of something of an influencer in in Canada, for example, and he something um, he he was uh, he put he has a lot of followers, and he was sharing how something happened with his flight um, with Expedia that he was not allowed onto the flight because of something of his name, and so he missed his bachelor party. Oh my gosh, TikTok went crazy. The video went viral in about a, about like less than an hour or two. It had a million views. And, you know, the comments are all like, cancel Expedia, cancel Expedia, cancel Expedia. And you're just like, ah, and we have a team on it. We are looking at it, but you have to understand the back end of it takes a little time. We've got to look into it. We've got to check with customer service. Is Because you can go on, anybody can go on social media and say whatever they want. Our job is to verify it, right? As the PR people, I need to go in and check. we got to talk with customer service. That takes time. So by then you're already canceled, right? So we, we moved quickly, right? So I just, I think that it's a kind reminder to everybody that social media can be powerful, but remember that there are brands, we are listening. We're trying to act on it, trying to do the right thing we did with him. And, and there were things in the back end, and we just, you know, we worked out a new uh, bachelor party for him and he enjoyed it with his friends, but um, you know, it's so fast and you have to react so quickly. Um, and that's one part of it because you have that proactive kind of calendar of posts that you're going to have to engage, but then you have this reactive that changed our whole day, right? When you get something like that, you've got to shift everything, right? And drop everything and address that immediately. So that's where things change, right? Really, really quickly. And you've got to be so quick to respond to those things and how you respond is really important in the eyes of the consumer. Um, so that's just one example of the power of social media. It's, it's a powerful tool, but, you know, goes both ways. <laughs> So that's a really interesting point that you're making. Um, you're talking about new and different and increased segments in terms of channels, but you also mentioned market segments. And, and uh, we are talking, we're always looking at the global market, right? So what do you see there? Um, is, it, is it possible to have a good strategy that you roll out in all your markets at the same time? Do you want to take that one, Anna, or do you want me to uh, take it? Why don't you take it? Because I can talk to my previous company, but I think we go to hear the Expedia since you guys are global. Yeah, it's uh so we have it's, it's a whole it's a process. Um, but we have global moments. So for example, a campaign that will launch that we all again, like I said, we're all aligned, we're all behind it, we plan it together. So let's say April 24th, we're going to launch XYZ travel on Expedia. Great. So we're all aligned on all of that. What we then do, so we have that global messaging and we have that global moment, but then what's really important, each country then goes and then we have PR team members and social media members that are, are, have oversight on each market and they then go back, okay, this is what we need to communicate. What will work for us in the UK, for example? Like, okay, uh, in-person press event, not so good, but let's talk to these two journalists and I'm going to give them an exclusive that works for us in the UK. The U.S., great, and we're going to have a big press event in New York City, and we're going to invite 30 journalists, consumer lifestyle, great. Uh, Australia, we're going to just go on the Today Show and the morning show there and have a big unveil there. So each country then localizes it by their market, but we are all aligned under that that message, right? That's the most important that we're all in the same, but then you localize it by market. And the same goes with social media, like, right? What is the message that they want to communicate? What works in their market? Who do they target? The segmenting of the, the posts, um, organic versus paid, all of that is really important. So that's a quick snapshot. Thank you. Anna, do you want to say something? You mentioned NI and uh, did you, were you seeing, I know your AffiniPay job is quite new, so were you seeing this at some evolution at uh, National Instruments before you changed jobs? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, it was also very important that we just didn't push the same campaign without adding something that was specific to that region. 
I think that people are proud and they have different, as Gretel says, different ways of engaging with the content. So you have to take that into account, right? Where are some of the countries where we could do more in person? Where were some of the countries where social media would work better? Where were some of the countries where it was more traditional and a, a, a different type of engagement? I, I will say that having you know national instruments have offices all around the world you know, even in Asia, what you do in China is different than what you do in Australia, is different than what you do in India, is different than what you do in Japan. And what we had to make sure was that the, that the brand was consistent, the story of the company was consistent, but then, you know, you need to add those examples, those twists, and you need to understand the different flavors of the culture because people are proud of the cultures and, and you can not just okay I'm, I'm I'm American company so now I'm going to push my American message it it will blow back in your face if you if you do that I remember this was just um my second year at NI we had the values and uh, we were launching we have modernized our values we were launching values and that's internal that's not even external and they you know, share with me initial um, the, the initial review of the values for Latin America because I speak Spanish, so they gave me the value for Latin America. And when you translate some of those words and try to use the Latin America translation, I was like, no, this is not going to go. People will feel offended with some of these uh, sentences because the way we, yeah, I know we are, we are translating for English, but it doesn't mean the same. So it, it took me, I had to go then move with a meeting because through email, they were not understanding. They were like, but we're translating it and we agree on the values in English. I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't mean the same. So maybe we can do examples. We can work with the team. We can keep English and, you know, explain what it means, but you cannot do, do this translation. So it really had everybody thinking, Oh my God, if this is just simple translation, imagine everything else you do, you know, and the customer is seeing it and how it can impact it. If you really don't understand that cultural difference, you don't have that global, uh, you know, approach to how you do your work. Yeah, this, I was just going to add more, uh, one more example, like maybe you could bring it to life of one, something that we did do um, last year in November. Um, it was, it was a cross, it was a global cross-brand travel trends event that we did, um, which basically, like I mentioned, we have the three brands. The first time all three brands came together to share, this was in November, to share 2023 travel trends. So we pull all this data and survey and we say, okay, people are traveling. And in, in, for example, Expedia, we talked about set jetting, like people are watching shows like Emily in Paris. And then now you're planning your trip to Paris. You're basing your travel based on your show that you're watching. We unveiled all these travel. Great. That's the plan. We're going to unveil our travel trends. How are we going to do that everywhere? So that was a whole process of the whole, every, every country then and PR team had to go back. What ended up happening? And then we had to like coordinate times, like Australia can't go first and the US because US is the biggest market. So we need to go first. Um, but then they lose some. Anyway, we, we ended up having a big press event about um, 100 journalists came to New York City. We had an event um, with Andy Cohen as our host. Um, Canada, we were like, okay, let's, let's have a host and all that. They're like hockey, hockey is amazing for Canada. Let's have it at the hockey hall of fame. And we had the Stanley cup that worked for Canada. That was such a genius idea because that's very unique to Canada. That would not have worked in the U S Mexico. We also had an event, but with a local broadcast, uh, he's a, a host on TV Azteca, one of the major TV stations, and he was a host, et cetera, et cetera. So Basically, each country came up with something that worked for them, but we all coordinated the time, the messaging, um, the materials were all the same. So it was actually a very beautiful execution, a lot of details behind the scenes, but that gives you an idea of how you can bring them something to life, very complex across many markets. Uh, it takes a lot of planning and thinking through, but then it's it's just very gratifying when you see it kind of come to place and all the thought that went into it um, with all those details. So that, that was a really good one. Thank you. So um, all of this is so complex, right? Um, and there's kind of a matrix of things you have to take into consideration. And I'm not even thinking about the all the time zones, right? Because you roll something out in the U.S. and and it's the following day already in another country. And wow. Um, but one of the things that I'm thinking about is the role that technology is playing in all of this, because obviously technology 
uh, particularly in the last few years, some of the changes, some of the advances in technology are really enabling uh, us to ramp up in a huge way. And it's also creating challenges. And Anna, when we talked, you were talking about the, the, uh, the challenges associated with identifying, just keeping track of the providers and what you want from them and what they do and, and some of the challenges there. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit? I'll be happy to. So I've been in technology now for a long time, right? I went from, from Dell, um, National Instruments, and now to, to Finipay. And it's in order to keep up, in order to make sure you are a, looking, targeting the right people, you, you need to make sure you're using, you know, the, the technology, the artificial intelligence, you're using the, the tools that there is in the market. But more and more, and who, who, if some of you work with marketing providers, vendors that, that provide technology, the number of technologies keep growing. And it's very important if you make decisions, a company can come and say, oh, we are the, you know, we're going to identify who are the, the customers that are going to buy from you and give you the leads and you have, your business will go crazy, right? After all our data. But if they are not following the right rules, if they are not being transparent with their information, they, you your brand can be affected because you ended up working with a company that is it was not a trusted company. So it there is a challenge when you just go with a very small a startup when they haven't proved really that they are using the, the right processes. I know, you know, some of the, the big companies have been in trouble because of doing things that are not completely ethical, like targeting to kids, like, you know, using data to, to augment their models when the customer hasn't given them the you know, the accepted that they can use their data. So I, I, I do think that whenever a, a tiny object comes my way, my team will bring tiny objects my way, right? Oh, we have this great idea or we have this great vendor who's going to solve all our problems. I always like my team to investigate who are they working with? Who are their customers? Who are they pro their providers? Because I, I, I don't want to get into a, problem where I end up damaging my brand because I'm thinking I'm going to get this cheaper, I'm going to get this faster. It, it's very important. In the end, you are committed to your customers and your employees and you know your investors, and you have to make sure you always do the right thing. So I, I, I think that that's, that will be my thing with technology. Yes, it's amazing and there is more and it's super exciting. But, but uh, you know, do that due diligence. And it can be as simple as you sit in a meeting with these vendors and just say, okay, tell me, how do you get all this data, right? How do, how do you build these models? And some of them, you will see them immediately that something is not right. And uh, you'll get that sense, or you can ask also your network. I'm always asking my network, who do you recommend? Who do you work with? Because again, I, I don't want to be in, in, in a bad place um, where, when six start to, to go down for, for any specific vendor. Okay, thank you. I can just imagine, you know, in the startup world, startups often aren't around very long, or maybe they're around, but they get, they get acquired by a different company. And now you're dealing with a different set of rules and a different set of terms and conditions and user interface perhaps and so on. So um, uh, I can imagine that that's a really complicated uh, thing to constantly monitor and manage. Gretel, do you have any experiences that you would like to describe along those lines? Yeah, I think for us um, and in general, right, where the, the industry is going, especially for consumers, uh, for companies that work with consumers, ours is our, our business would be a business to consumer. Um, part of it, the majority of it is mobile first. So I, I guess let's do like a show of hands. Who, like, think of the last trip that you planned. Did you go online to, who went online to a website to plan that trip? Did you go, if you went online, did you do it online? Hands up. Let's see. Let's see. Hands up. Who did it all on your phone? Who booked a trip on your phone? Ah, 
see oh still some traditional online for us though it's the movement right even when you're on your phone you're searching maybe you're like stuck in traffic you're like let me look at flights right now you do it on your phone right so the mobile first experience is really really important right um and um and, and in that the back end of that is really you know, a huge process with our team. And it's just developing a lot of tools across all the brands in order to develop things that were online first, like one of our brands, hotels.com. It's in the, the name that it's a .com. And that one's just migrating to really be mobile first, right? That your experience when you open the mobile app is amazing. All of the, and there's so many details that go into that, that the team is incredible, that we have an entire, of course, team that works on that, but they're thinking of the entire customer experience, right? Of, and that's where marketing comes in, right? It's the entire funnel. What I do with PR is the top of the funnel, right? It's brand awareness. And I'm going to get you to think about our brand. And then as you, the more narrowed in, then we want you to come to our site and we want you to go and we want you to book a flight. You're going to search, you're going to become a member. You're going to open, you're going to give us your email and you're going to open an account. All of that is the journey. How is that journey experience on mobile versus desktop is very different, right? Um, that's one of them. And the other one is artificial intelligence. There's so much talk about AI right now. And that is huge, right? Every data, machine learning, and all of that is integrated into all the products across to make that journey, customer journey from, again, the moment you open the app, to the moment that you book your flight and you receive an email, that entire journey um, is super important and AI plays a very important part of it. So simple things like we have tools like price tracking where you can now go and um, through the tools that we offer on the app, you can go and say, okay, I'm gonna go to LA in April and we will notify you when the prices drop so that you can go and say, okay, this is probably the best time to book your flight. And so you can go in and book. So that those are the type of technology, right? That that were always at the forefront and and have changed a lot and it's quickly evolving, right? So um, those are just some examples. Thank you. Um, so I'm on my last question here to ask you, and I know that our audience has lots of uh, questions. So please put your questions in the chat and I will review them while our uh, speakers are answering. And, um, <clears throat> see if we can get some of your questions answered. But um, Anna and Gretel, I'm, um, I'm curious about your thoughts on the types of skills that someone who wants to be, uh, who wants to work in um, uh, marketing or PR in a global context should uh, seek to acquire. Uh, what, do, what do people need to know who want to function in um, in either of your fields in the global context? I, I can start. I think that uh, there is, first and foremost, you need to have that desire to learn because you will not be an expert in all the areas, in all the segments, in all the audiences. But if you're in marketing, you be you need to be that type of person that if you go to an airport, you sit down to start looking and observing everybody and seeing, you know, what are the different things people are doing. Uh, you, you you need to be in, to enjoy, to, to learn how people are engaging, right? What are our competitors doing? How, how are the different areas around the globe in adapting or engaging with your content? You also need agility. Agility because this uh, the market the market and and the world is moving so fast that things change right so back on the day we did our planning for the year and we need our planning for the quarter i remember when adele we started planning by quarter it was like a big deal well now you do a plan but you have to constantly be saying what do i change what do i adjust right and 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 looking at it from different angles and if it's from a global perspective, from different regions, from different type of audiences. I think that that will be the second one. And the third one uh, is a strategic mindset to see, are, uh, am I doing you know, the right thing for the customer and I'm focusing on the right areas for this customer so I can grow the experience of my customer and grow the, the exposure of my brand. I think those are very important, um, you know, skills. Again, the first one is that learning, be a learner, be agile and have a strategic mindset. 
regardless of what where you end up. So you can keep up and you can learn and you can be ahead of what, what's going on. And I'm interested in hearing from, from Gretel uh, because her world is, you know, the PR, it's more more shiny and, and have more things going on on that, on that front. Oh, I don't know about that, but um, the, from a PR perspective, there's certain things and that some of it is very bare bones. You have to learn, love to write. We need good writers. You think it's creative and we do all these events. I mean, at the core of what we do is writing. So I love writing and I've always loved writing. That's why I studied journalism and everything. We write press releases. We write talking points. I write speeches for executives. We write um, simple uh, messaging, internal communications for executives to communicate with employees. The messaging, the words you use are so, so important. So the love of writing is so important. Um, the second thing is curiosity. Be curious. And I think that goes with Anna's point of learning. Um, to be in the world of PR, everything we've discussed, it moves fast. Um, so you have to be an avid reader in my world. We need to read. I need to like know everything that's going on, not only in the travel world, what is people talking about travel, but I want to know about entertainment. What are people talking about entertainment? What are the trends? What are people talking about? What's the latest movie coming out? And Emily in Paris. Okay, great. We got to talk about that. What are the top 10 hotels you can book in Paris on hotels.com? Here you go. So just, you know, we're always every day on, we have Slack, we use internally a, a tool called Slack and that's how we communicate as a team and like, Hey, I saw this article. Is there something, there's there an angle for Expedia to jump on this and we can get, be part of that or something like that. So curiosity and being an avid reader of news, like we need you to know the news and current events. It's so, so important. Um, and then the third one is, well, I would say three, four, I have another one is creativity. We love creative ideas. We need creative, great ideas right now. I just had a brainstorm. I got off a brainstorm earlier today and it's just literally, okay, here's what we need to launch. How do we, how do we bring it to life through consumers and through travel and, and the more creative, the better. Um, but sometimes the creativity, you don't have much budget. So how do you do it without little, with little budget? So creativity and, and kind of pushing the boundaries, those ideas, we love creative ideas. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing that kind of brings it all together and ties a little bit with what Anna was saying too, is yes, you've got to be creative, be a good writer. You've got to love entertainment, all that, but you need to know the business. So business acumen is really important. So I think everything, the Center for Global Business, this, is, this would be the plug, right? Right here, but it's true. Everything you're learning, if you're at the, you know, and, and the Combs, the business part of it is so important. I wish I had a stronger foundation in that when I graduated, I didn't. So I feel like now the opportunities are much broader for students to really have tap into both. You could have a minor, right? Where you're, or advertising or marketing major, and then you minor in that business. The business part of it is so important because yes, you can come up with a really creative idea to launch a new whatever travel trends. Cool. We're going to have an event in New York. How does that tie to the business? How am I going to drive increased revenue? How am I going to drive increased membership and app downloads and things that are really going to drive the business so that our CEO gives us money, you know? So that is so important. So the business acumen and understanding return on investment, how to manage budgets, um, all of that is so important. That is makes you a really, really strong PR professional that you're not just kind of up here giving great ideas, but you're telling me how it really will help the business. So those are just a few things from, from my perspective that I've seen. Super, thank you. So um, we have some fantastic questions. I'm gonna lead with this one. Uh, this is not one of our current students, but I happen to know this one comes from an IB alum. So uh, I'm proud to be uh, to be leading with this question. Um, we've all been discussing AI as a ma major tool moving into the middle of the decade, but are you at all concerned with the future of content marketing in light of the proliferation of chatbots? What steps have you been taking to compete against what might be more keyword focused artificial content? Do so you want to take that one then or I can take, I, I, and again, this is not my world. I'm more on the PR marketing side. What I do is the teams come up with the AI strategy and I communicate it and PR it. So I'm not the expert in AI. Um, what I will say is that it is very important, but it's finding that fine balance, right? It is something um, and I think I, I saw something that went viral the other day of some, a journalist that was talking to, I think it was Microsoft, um, and they did an, an AI test with one of their bots and the conversation just, it was radical. If you've not seen that, it was just 
the conversation just took a turn. Um, so it's risky, right? So it's it's a fine balance of making sure that you still can have that authentic connection with customers, but you have to scale, right? So in order to scale, you have to have systems in place. And that's where artificial intelligence helps you in order to um, make sure you have that scale and can it help millions of customers. Like in the company like Speedo, we need to service millions of customers every second, every day. So something like that helps us, right? But you cannot lose the in-person, right? So we have customer service. You can still call and talk to a physical person, right? And so I think it's having that fine balance and there's very smart people at the top that are thinking of that every day as a really fun, fundamental part of the business. And how do you find that balance, right? To, to, to make sure that customer journey and experience is optimal throughout the entire process. So it's 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 quite the thing. I don't know, Anna, if you want to add anything to that. I will just add that on our end, on, on the industry that I am, we actually differentiate ourselves because we have all our customer service, it's uh, with people. So we don't use AI, we don't use the the bots, like the chats, right? We, we When you chat, you chat with somebody that's sitting at our office. So I, I think it, and, and that's what have basically make our customers loyal and want to stay with us because there's so much competition. So it is a trade-off that you have to make. There is a lot of things you can make with artificial intelligence. The question is, where do you use it? Where it's scalable? Where you can afford to not use it? Because you can still have that one-to-one -one, uh, support. Yeah, I, I I like your I, both your answers. I think that's so important. I th I'm sure we've all had the experience where you uh, you ask a question, um, you explain something, and the chatbot asks you exactly what you just explained because uh, you didn't explain it in a way that it was prepared to analyze. So, uh, and that's a turnoff, right? So I um, I'm with you on that one. Um, uh, here's an interesting question, really different, different direction. Have you observed any cultural quality abroad in a business setting that you think would be beneficial to adopt in the U.S.? So just throwing that out there really quick. I know both of you have deep experience in Latin America. Um, if you could remake U.S. business culture uh, uh, in the image of Latin America, what thing would you choose to change? One thing I like, you know, from other cultures outside the U.S. is that sometimes they take the time to analyze and uh, do some assessment before coming with an answer. And that was the, one of the things that for me coming into this culture was very different. People just throw answers and sometimes there's nothing to back that up. So I think there is a, a middle point that can exist, right? So. I like when I've been in meetings, you know, in teams that are global because I know that some people are quiet, but they are quiet because they are thinking it through versus the people who always speak up are just because sometimes they're just, you know, throwing it out of, of, of the firehouse and, and, and letting it. So I, I challenge my teams to discuss it offline and uh, use and, and, and come to something that is more in the middle but I think that's something that for me has been interesting to observe. Yeah, I would add um, something specific for Latin America. It's a very warm culture, right? We we have to we start conversations by asking how we are, and, um, and you, you know, care about the answer. You yes, we just we do. The small talk is important, and it's meaningful. And we get to know each other, and that's important. Sometimes it's good and bad. Sometimes you're like cut, 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 right? But um, <laughs> but I think it's sometimes it's nice, right? Because I think it's a cultural shock sometimes here because meetings are just like to jump, especially in Zoom world, right? We're very much like we start on time and then we end, right? There's no trans. It's a very transactional world, right? Where we're just kind of like, hey, I'm here for my meeting. Uh, bye, see you later. Versus Latin America, there's a conversation. How was your day? You have to start off with that. And sometimes that's good. It warms things up and it makes people feel more comfortable in an environment. Um, and I think also something Anna mentioned is, is also relevant. Again, in Zoom world, it's 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 something to think about, right? With different cultures and different languages. Some people don't dominate English, right? And meetings take place in English. And that's really hard for somebody who doesn't you know, feel comfortable expressing themselves in that language. And I think um, something that everybody here, many companies are very US centric, right? It's very US. Yes, you might have operations globally, but 
your headquarters are here in the US. And so you talk English and your teams are in New York and you're here and you forget you have somebody in Brazil and you forget you have somebody in India and the language is a barrier, right? And they won't speak up as much. So again, to Anna's point, who dominates? It's the team in the US and they're talking fast. And so just being very conscious of that, inviting others for their opinions is very important too. Oh, uh, Susana, do you think that will work in Brazil? Great, and give her that opportunity. I think that's really an important thing that we can learn um, to, to make sure that we're thinking of everybody and especially again, in these Zoom environments, something to think about. So Thank many you. questions, this chat is on fire. The chat is on fire. We're not <laughs> going to get to, we're not going to get anywhere near all of them. Um, okay, quickly, you mentioned tailoring PR campaigns and initiatives to the local target environment. To what extent do you find it necessary to work with a group of people on the ground to understand how your campaign fits the local environment? How do you avoid exporting, how do you avoid exporting American cultural norms through PR and marketing very quickly? So important, so important to have that local local mind and presence. Sometimes you can't always have somebody, you know, an employee in those different countries, but you have ex they all know the market. What we do is we work with agencies. So we really work with PR agencies or marketing agencies. That's what we hire them for. They are experts in their market. I do not claim to be an expert in Brazil. I, you know, I know the market in general and I know how it works, but I depend on that agency partner to have those local media contacts to assess, to give me guidance and counsel because they know their market better than anybody. So I think it's really important to really um, work with local agency partners is really the main thing. Or if you're lucky to hire somebody on your team who is based, for example, in Mexico City, great. You have a local talent that you need to tap into and you can ask questions. If not, an agency partner. Maybe my answer, I don't know. Anna, anything else? The same, the same, Adele and I, the same, rely on who are the experts in the region versus trying to get a, uh, an agency here that is just trying to manage something in a, in a country. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to move to this one because, Anna, I think you, I remember maybe both of you mentioning this when we talked before. How has the push for more DEI efforts affected your global marketing strategies? But also, I know you've talked about your own team. Uh, and so there's the internal audience and there's the external audience uh, or whatever. And how does implementation differ based on the country? How do you maintain a cohesive corporate message? Uh, of supporting DEI uh, when working in regions that may not have this as a value. So one of the things that it was a change I draw for NI was that we, when we we think about the brand, right? We're measuring the brand based on our customer feedback, and we we're saying, okay, we are a strong brand because customers recognize us, because customers are aware of that, etc. But one of the things that I realized as we started really talking more about employees and the communities is that if you think about the brand, there is four dimensions you need to always work on when you're building your brand and you're building your, your message. Yes, it's the customer, but it's the employee, it's the community. So that's depending on the region, a different community. And of course, you know, your investors because you cannot forget them. But that means that your DEI, the efforts you are doing become part of your brand story. And that means that you incorporate the different flavors, the efforts you are doing in different regions, depending on what it's, you know, the, the expectations and the focus. And it also helps you to have um, what we would call brand takes a stand. So based on where you are, how you want to be, uh, you know, foreseeing, what is important for your community, your employees, your customers, and your investors, you can decide what are the, the it can help you decide what are the topics and what are the, the stand and the, the, the decision you're going to make when different topics come into the market, right? When we start about uh, talking about Black Lives Matter, when you start talking about the, the Ukrainian uh, conflict, what is your brand going to be talking about and how they're going to be approaching this? And uh, we had a, a, a core team and, you know, decisions very fast. Every time there was a, 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 a difficult topic we needed to approach, but it was part of one effort. So DEI was not a separate piece. It was part of bringing it all together as a, as a company, as a brand. 
I'll just add to that. Um, totally agree with that. And then for me, it's very important companies that don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk, right? So don't just say that you're here because you want to be there for Latino and you're here for the Black community and you're here for, I want to see it. So that's part of my role. And I'm, I'm proud of a lot of things that we've done in PR to actually show up for the communities and different events and put the money where we say it is. That's really important. So I think, it, and to Anna's point, it's integrated. It's not like a separate, like, oh, we have a DNI marketing team. It's integrated. So across Expedia, I'm thinking about how do we reach the Latino market? Okay, we're sponsoring the Mexican soccer team. Great. How else are we going to do it? Um, black community, where we have a black and well traveled platform. Great. We're going to, we participated in an event in Vail uh, with the National Brotherhood of Skiers with 2,000 black skiers that were all on the slopes in Vail. And we were there as Verbo and we took journalists. So, how can we have these different moments within our brand that are being um, authentic and authentically connecting with the different communities? That's the most important the authentic connection and showing up, um, not just money's great and throwing money at things, but you have to show up as a brand and do it in an authentic way that connects with the consumers. So that's a really important thing. Thanks. Um, uh, fantastic answers. I'm glad you also um, touched a little bit on uh, the uh, war uh, between Russia and Ukraine because we actually had a couple of questions about that. Um, here's one last question. Um, what, what are the steps to take to introduce a venture in an area with a different cultural practices, different cultural practices? More importantly, in an event that a marketing can, in the event that a marketing campaign initially doesn't align well with the cultural context of a region and things aren't going well, what steps do you take to turn the situation around? So how do you repair when you find that you're not in a in alignment with a particular location? Um, do you exit the country? Do you change your strategy? Do you issue an apology? How do you move things around? I know you both have had experience with uh, changing direction to for better alignment. I, I can start. So I, I think, you know, you need to do your homework. Right now, for example, we are, we are evaluating expanding into other countries. So right now we're doing our homework, not only from the product, but if we are a good fit for that, you know, country, for that culture, for, for the, those people, what are they going to require from us? What are the expectations? Um, if, but if you haven't done it and you launched something and it was not the right fit for that uh, area or that um, region, you have to be honest and just say, okay, we, we made you know a mistake. We and and acknowledge that versus just changing something and saying okay we forget just forget what we did. Let's erase it from all our social media and let's let's just appear within nothing happened. So I think that just acknowledging it and then um, you know do some focus groups, um, talk to people, get their reaction, get their feedback. If you're in B two B, talk to your sales people. Your sales people know the customer really well. So if you can put things in front of yourself, people and yourself leader, they will know how to, you know, anticipate if there's going to be a, a bad reaction or not. Um, that would be my, my advice. Yeah, be fast, be transparent, be authentic and make changes. I mean, that's a quick summary, I think, right? Is <laughs> that you, you just, you can't sit on it. And if something was wrong in your decision, it was public, whatever it was, be fast, analyze. We've had a lot of PR. There's, it's all, it could look fun, but there's a lot of behind the scenes. Um, that is takes place, right? We have to start, certain things happen, then we regroup internally. Let's talk to legal. Let's talk to the executives. Who was involved? What happened? Why did it happen? Find all the details. Find all the things. Then come forward with the strategy, right? And what are you going to say publicly? Um, and there's legal stuff and all that, but you have to regroup internally. But then move fast to give your response in a way that's authentic. Um, and if you ch need to change something, change it quickly, right? Um, and just like Anna said, be as open as you can with what you are going to change. And like, you know what, we tried this, it didn't work and we heard you and we're going to adapt. And now we're going to focus on X, Y, Z. So the, we heard you message works really well. Um, and that we're adapting based on the feedback that we heard. And, you know, I think every company has gone through that. So it happens a lot. So it's just how you react and how quickly and authentically, um, you can communicate that. 
Well, I think that that is, uh, those are great points for us to, uh, to take away. Um, so much value in this presentation. Thank you very, very much. I cannot thank both of you enough for the many contributions you've made to international, international business education at UT. Um, and we will post this presentation online on our blog. So um, feel free to, uh, to check back and watch it again. And um, thank you all for very good questions for joining us tonight. And Anna and Gretel, thank you so very much for your insightful comments. Good evening, everyone.